Hi everyone, welcome to lesson 12. Today we're going to be talking uh, more about faith and uh, also good works. So our lesson question then today, what role do good works play in a Christian's life? Uh, you have maybe heard before um, someone saying that, that Lutherans, uh, we Lutherans are against good works, that we don't believe in good works, uh, and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, we as Christians, we as Lutherans, uh, we love good works, we do good works, and we'll talk about the proper place, the proper role for good works in uh, our lives. So uh, we are still on the third article of uh, the Apostles' Creed. We have uh, started memorizing it. We'll memorize the rest of it um, after this lesson. Uh, but we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who creates faith in our hearts, gives us the ability and the desire to do good works. Uh, we'll talk more about that. First, though, let's uh, go to our uh, Bible reading here in this lesson. Acts chapter uh, 16, verses 16 through 34, where Paul and Silas comfort the jailer in Philippi. So we're going to see here in this uh, interesting account how uh, Paul and Silas were put into jail for helping a young girl with an evil spirit and how they told others about their faith in Jesus even when in jail. Uh, so let's pause the video and please read Acts 16, 16 through 34. Okay, let's look at the questions. So number one, how was a slave girl able to earn money for her masters? Uh, looking specifically at verse 16. So we are told here that this slave girl was possessed by an evil spirit. In other words, a demon, a, a fallen angel, uh, possessed by an evil spirit and by the power of this evil spirit was able to, in some way, to some degree, predict the future. Uh, we know that demons um, as fallen angels are powerful. Uh, the devil and uh, his evil angels, they are able to, to do things that we humans are not able to do. And this apparently is one of them. We really don't have anything else in the rest of the Bible that talks about uh, demons being able to predict the future. But, but here uh, we're told that, that this spirit, this demon, uh, was able to uh, see some things, we don't know how many things or how far into the future or anything like that, but was able to see some things in the future. Uh, and so people then uh, would, would hear about this slave girl who was able to predict the future. Um, and so they would come and pay and, and she would tell them their future or, or whatever, tell them uh, what would happen. Number two, uh, what was she doing though that annoyed Paul and Silas and uh, Luke. Luke is, is there too. When uh, you read in the book of Acts and it says, and then we did this or this happened to us, uh, Luke is the one who is writing the book of Acts. And so when he uses the first person like that, uh, that means that, that he is, is there too, uh, that he is, is personally involved in these things. And so we have Paul and Silas and Luke, they're on a missionary journey there in, in the city of Philippi. And they come across this, uh, this slave girl. And what is she doing that annoys them?
So this uh, slave girl possessed by this demon, uh, she sees uh, these men, and by the power of this demon, she knows who they are um, and what they're doing, and, and she starts telling people, uh, these are servants of God. They've come to share the good news of salvation. And number three, we might wonder, well, uh, what she said about Paul and his companions was absolutely true. Uh, so why would they be annoyed by this? Why why would they tell her, why would they want her to stop saying this if it was uh, exactly true? Take some time to think about that. So the problem here wasn't that uh, this girl uh, was telling lies about them. Uh, the problem was that they didn't want to be associated with demons in any way. Um, so what, what this demon is saying through this girl, that's true, uh, but they don't want to, to give even the impression uh, that they are in league with this demon, that they are partners with this, uh, this demon. Um, this is not the sort of publicity uh, that they are, are looking for. Number four, why were the girls' masters so upset with Paul and Silas? So Paul uh, frees this girl from the grips of this demon. He casts the demon out. Uh, but when that happens, it means that this girl can no longer predict the future. And if this girl can no longer predict the future, that means that her masters are not going to be able to make money off of her uh, anymore. And that's what they're upset about, that they can't make any more uh, money. They, they really don't care about her, about her well-being. Uh, what they really care about is is the money. Number five, what happened to Paul and Silas as a result of uh, this, this act of kindness, really, that they uh, did for this girl? So uh, the girls' uh, masters, they, they uh, cause a scene, they stir people up, and eventually Paul and Silas, as a result of this, uh, are arrested and uh, beaten, beaten pretty severely, and then thrown into prison. Number six, why do you suppose that Paul and Silas were joyfully singing hymns to God even after they were beaten and thrown into prison? If you uh, did something nice for a poor girl um, who was suffering terribly from demon possession, if you uh, do something nice to a girl and then you get beaten for it and thrown into prison, um, would you be singing hymns of, of praise uh, to God? Uh, why, why were they uh, singing hymns to God?
so why are Paul and Silas able to sing hymns uh, to God even after being severely beaten and thrown into prison? Uh, well, they trusted in God to deliver them. We're told uh, there in, in verse 25 that uh, they were not only singing hymns, but uh, praying to the Lord. And and so uh, we assume that maybe some of these hymns really were were prayers. Many of these hymns probably uh, came from the book of Psalms, and there are many prayers in the book of Psalms uh, asking God for, for help and for deliverance and strength. And so um, as they are, are praying to God for help, they are singing these hymns, asking God for help, trusting in God to help them, to uh, deliver them. Um, and the same thing is, is true for us. You know, when we are in difficult circumstances, um, right in the middle of, of suffering or, or whatever it might be, um, singing hymns can be a wonderfully uh, comforting uh, thing, reminding ourselves of God's promises, asking God for his uh, deliverance. Okay, number seven, after the earthquake, so there's this earthquake that shakes uh, the prison and, and the, the gates fly open, the bars fly off, um, the cells and so on. Uh, why do you think the jailer was going to take his own life? He rushes in, he sees that all of the, the cells are open, the, the gates have, have uh, fallen off, and he is going to take his own life. Why do you think that is? So why is this jailer going to take his own life? We aren't given a whole lot of insight into what he's thinking, but uh, in the Roman Empire, uh, for a jailer to allow his prisoners to escape, it would have been uh, a public disgrace. His reputation would have been completely destroyed. Uh, he would have been executed. Uh, for failing in his duty. The Romans took duty very seriously, and if you uh, fail, uh, then uh, in many cases you would be executed for uh, that failure to do what you uh, were required to do. And so uh, this jailer, he wants to avoid public disgrace. Uh, he wants to avoid uh, execution, and so he's just going to uh, take the the easy way out is as he sees it. Number eight, the jailer likely had heard Paul and Silas praying and singing hymns about Jesus. Uh, again, in those days in the Roman Empire, usually the way it worked, and we don't know specifically if this is the way it worked there in Philippi, but, but typically uh, the jailer would live kind of on the, the main floor and then the basement would be the jail, would be the, the prison. Uh, so you'd have the prisoners down in the basement and then the the jailer and his family would live on the main level. And so probably, uh, if you imagine it being that way, um, Paul and Silas are down there in the basement. They are singing these hymns. Probably the, the jailer heard Paul and Silas um, singing these hymns. Uh, but whether he, he heard them or not, how do we know for sure that the law must have been working on his heart? Think back about um, what we... Uh, learned about when it came to the law, what the law does, uh, the purpose of the law. How can you tell that the law has been working on this man's heart? So what do we see this jailer uh, say in his uh, despair and fear? Uh, he, he asks uh, Paul and Silas, again, we assume that he had heard them singing hymns, and that's why he asked 
uh, them. But, but what must I do to be saved? He knew very clearly that he was in need of salvation. And that's the purpose of the law, right? The law shows us our sins, shows us our need for uh, salvation. Uh, this man's conscience, it, it sure seems like uh, his conscience had been bothering him. Uh, the law written on the heart, we talked about that in previous lessons. And so he knows the law, he knows that he's failed. Uh, he feels guilty. He knows he needs something, and he thinks maybe Paul and Silas um, have the, the answer for him, and uh, they absolutely do. Number nine, we learned in lesson nine that when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, he secured a general or objective justification, which means that everyone's sins are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Uh, what did that mean for the jailer? Is he included in that? Was the jailer included um, in, in the work of Jesus on the cross? Of course, absolutely. Uh, Jesus had paid the price for this man's uh, sins also. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this man uh, obviously was included in the world. His sins had been taken away by Jesus, but he had no idea about Jesus or what Jesus had done. So number 10, Paul told the jailer to believe in Jesus as the way to be saved. Uh, told the jailer to have faith. Uh, and just to review what we talked about in the last lesson, what does it mean to believe in Jesus or to have faith in Jesus? So what does it mean to believe in Jesus, to have faith in Jesus? It means to trust in him for forgiveness and salvation. Uh, not just knowing who he is or knowing some of the basic facts about his life or, or, or something like that. Believing in Jesus means trusting in him, relying on him for forgiveness and salvation. And then we see that uh, chart there on page uh, 57, and we want to focus especially on that, that right-hand side. So we, we talked about how Jesus Christ died on the cross to redeem us, to pay the price, to set us free and make us his own. Um, and this becomes ours uh, by faith. Uh, the work of the Holy Spirit through the gospel of salvation, like we talked about last time, uh, the Holy Spirit does his work uh, through the gospel, uh, the means of grace, the means through which he delivers this to us. He creates faith in our hearts, and that faith uh, receives uh, the work of Jesus on the cross. That's how uh, what Jesus did 2,000 years ago gets delivered to us, becomes our own, uh, is applied to us uh, personally. So number 11, the jailer was overjoyed when he realized that there was nothing that he could do, nothing he had to do to earn God's forgiveness, but that he could simply trust God's promise to save him. How did he express this joy?
So just think about the uh, dramatic change uh, that has occurred in this jailer's uh, heart and mind. Uh, he is ready to end his own life, to kill himself. Uh, that's how afraid he is, how desperate uh, he is. And in his desperation, uh, he turns to Paul and Silas. You know, is there is there anything I can possibly do to fix things? Is there anything I can possibly do to be saved? And they say, well, there's nothing that you have to do, but there's something that Jesus has done for you. Trust in him, believe in him, and uh, your sins are forgiven. Salvation is, is yours. What a, a joyful uh, turnaround uh, that must have been. Um, and how does the jailer express uh, his joy? Uh, well, he shows it in what he does, right? He uh, bandages their wounds. They've just been, been beaten severely, so he takes care of their injuries, bandages their wounds. Uh, he invites them to come into his home. Uh, he feeds them, provides for uh, their needs. Uh, he demonstrates his faith, his joy um, in, in his works, in what he does. And we'll come back to that important point. Number 12, though, first of all, uh, what can we do to earn God's love and forgiveness? Hopefully by now, uh, this is an easy one, uh, but uh, take some time to think about that. Make sure you have, have the right answer here. What can we do? What must we do to earn God's love and forgiveness? Like I said, hopefully an easy one. Uh, what can we do to earn God's love and forgiveness? Absolutely nothing. Uh, there is nothing that we have to do to earn forgiveness from God. There's nothing that we can do to earn forgiveness from God. Um, as we've said before, we were by nature dead in our sins. What can a dead person do? Absolutely nothing. What can we do uh, all on our own? Absolutely nothing nothing. Uh, God has done everything for us. Uh, Jesus has done everything for us. He has lived a perfect life for us. He has uh, suffered instead of us. There's nothing that we need to do. Uh, Jesus has done it all for us. Number 13, though, what can we do to show our thanks to God? Uh, for his love and his forgiveness. There's nothing we can do to earn those things, uh, but what can we do once we have received those things, once we have received this free gift of God's love and forgiveness, uh, what can we do to show our thanks for them? What can we do uh, to earn God's love and forgiveness? Nothing. What can we do to say thank you for the free gift of God's love and forgiveness? Uh, everything, anything that we possibly can do. We can do good works, uh, joyfully serving God, uh, joyfully serving others. Good works are not things that we do to earn God's love and forgiveness. They are things that we do to thank God for the gift of love and forgiveness. And we can uh, fill that in for our key term here, good works. Good works are uh, deeds, works, actions, things that we do. So deeds done by believers. Uh, if good works are done um, by those who have already received the gift of love and forgiveness, uh, then good works can only be done by believers. 
And this is an important point to remember because um, there are lots of unbelievers, lots of non-Christians who do good things in the world, right? Um, who donate money to cure diseases, to care for the homeless, whatever it might be. And from a worldly perspective, uh, those things are good. Um, from God's perspective, though, uh, the only works that are considered good by God are works done by believers. Unbelievers, in God's sight, um, they are still dead in sin, uh, completely separated from him, fallen away uh, from him. Unbelievers, even if they do things that are considered good in this world, they cannot do good works in God's sight. They're still dead. Dead people can't do anything. Okay, So in God's sight, as God defines it, as he sees it, good works can only be done by believers. Okay, Good works are those deeds that are motivated by our thanks. Things that we do simply out of our uh, joy uh, at being saved, our thanks for what God has done uh, for us. If we do something and we do it only because um, we uh, think that, that we can earn something from God, if we do something only to get the, the praise, only because of what's in it for us, we want other people to notice it and reward us for it, that, that's not a good work. Good works are those things that we do motivated by our thanks for God. And good works are those things that we do that are guided by God's will. Uh, good works um, are all about obeying God, doing the things that he wants us to do. And so um, if I go out and um, steal something from a store, and say, well, this is something done by a believer, so it must be a good work. Well, no, that's not a good work, not at all. That's a sin, um, because that is something that goes against the will of God. Um, and so good works are only those things done by believers, only those things motivated by a spirit of thanks, and only those things that are in line with God's will for us. Those are the things that make a good work a good work. Before we get to uh, the other key term uh, there, maybe we should take a look at the, the chart first because this really uh, illustrates what we were just uh, talking about with good works. Uh, so sanctification by the Holy Spirit, we, we mentioned that word sanctification before, this is the Holy Spirit setting us apart to be different, to be holy. Uh, so the Holy Spirit sets us apart the Holy Spirit leads us to be eager to do uh, good works. And then here we have kind of those three parts of what makes a good work a good work. So first of all, a good work is something that is empowered by Christ living in me through faith. So um, this is something that a, a believer does, because only believers have this connection to Christ, have Christ living in them through faith. So good works are empowered by Christ, by faith in Christ, are motivated by love and thanks for Christ, are guided by what God's word says is right. So uh, we have those three things there. A believer, uh, good works are something that a believer does as a thank you to God, according to God's will. Okay, and then we can go to that other term, a life of sanctification. Um, so a life of sanctification means living as the holy people that God has called us to be. Living lives that are filled with uh, good works, filled with holy deeds as we um, live the lives that God wants us to live. Uh, sanctification um, in some ways is a one-time thing. At a certain point in your life, the Holy Spirit set you apart to be a part of the, the family of God, to be holy. And the rest of our lives then we spend living our lives in that way, living this life of sanctification, um, living as the holy people that God has, has called us to be. 
And then there's just that note there too below the chart. Uh, in lesson 19, uh, we'll talk about using God's law as a guide. This is the third use of the law uh, to show us how to joyfully thank God with our lives. So this gets to that last point there. Um, uh, good works are good only if they're guided by what God's word says is right, only if they're done according to God's will. And we'll talk more about that. How do we know what God's will is? How does God's word guide us and show us what God wants us to do? Uh, we'll talk about that when we get to lesson 19. Okay, uh, number 14 then. Read 1 John 1, 7b, Romans 10, 17, Philippians 2, uh, 12 and 13, and Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Uh, what credit can we take for our forgiveness, for our faith, even our good works? Uh, you'll probably want to pause the video so that you have time to look up all of those passages. Um, what place... Um, is there for us to take credit? Um, when it comes to forgiveness or faith, good works, is there a place for us to take credit um, when it comes to any of these things? What credit uh, can we take for these things? Uh, no, uh, no credit, uh, none, none at all. Uh, these are all things that God gives to us freely, all things that God works in us. Uh, so forgiveness, that's something that Jesus won for us on the cross. It's something that he gives to us freely through faith. Uh, faith, like we talked about last time, is not something uh, that we choose to have. It's not a decision that we make. Uh, faith is something that the Holy Spirit creates in us. And even our good works, we might be tempted to think, well, I'm the one doing these good works, so I must get some credit. Um, but even these good works, um, God is the one who gives us the desire to do good works. He's the one who gives us the ability to do good works. Uh, he is the one who prepares them in advance for us to do, like it says in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 10. Uh, and so even our good works really are gifts that are given to us uh, by God. He's the one who works in us to do uh, these things. And so there's no room for arrogance here or, or pride. Uh, look at what a wonderful person I am, all of the, the wonderful things that I do. Um, God is the one who gives all of these things to us. God is the one who works all of these things in us, even our own uh, good works. We wouldn't be doing any good works if not for, for God. Okay, number 15. If we are unwilling to live as God wants us to live, even after we have come to know that God has loved us and forgiven us, what might that say about our faith? Read James 2, 14 through 17 and verse 26. Uh, again, probably you'll want to pause the video to look that up um, and think seriously about this. Um, what does it mean if um, we know what God has done for us, um, we know about all of these gifts that God gives, we know what he wants us to do, but we don't do it. We don't live the way he calls us to live. What, what does that mean about our faith? What might it mean about our faith if um, we are not um, actively engaged in doing good works? Well, uh, if faith naturally produces good works, and, and faith does naturally produce good works, then if those good works are lacking, 
um, it probably means that our faith is weak, uh, our faith is dying, maybe even that our faith is uh, dead. Um, our good works are the outward evidence of the faith in the heart. We can't see faith um, in someone's heart. Um, but what we can see is good works. And that's especially true when it comes to ourselves. You know, rather than looking at someone else's good works, maybe um, it starts by looking at our own lives, our own uh, good works. Um, good works are the outward evidence of the inner uh, faith in the heart. Um, and if those good works are lacking, uh, that probably says something about the faith in the heart. I'll give you maybe uh, two examples, two ways to think about this. Uh, so sometimes good works are called fruits of faith. So if you think of a fruit tree, let's say an apple tree, um, if an apple tree uh, every year produces lots of really good, beautiful apples, um, then you can probably conclude that is a healthy, strong apple tree. But if that apple tree one year doesn't produce uh, many fruits or doesn't produce fruit at all, um, then I think you'd be pretty safe in concluding that there's something wrong with this apple tree. Uh, this apple tree must be sick. Maybe this apple tree is, is dying uh, because it is not producing uh, fruit. Or um, another way of, of thinking about it, um, good works are kind of like uh, our uh, vital signs. Uh, you go to the doctor, the doctor doesn't know um, everything that's going on inside your body. They have tests that they can use to try to figure things out. But the, the doctor doesn't immediately know everything going on inside your body. But what they do is they check your vital signs, right? They'll uh, take your temperature, your blood pressure, things like that, because uh, those uh, uh, obvious things will uh, indicate a whole lot about what's going on uh, inside. If someone's vital signs are normal, are stable, are strong, uh, the doctor can conclude, well, nothing too serious at least is going on inside this person's body. They're not in danger of, of dying um, right here and right now. But if someone's vital signs are very weak, um, if their, their heartbeat is very weak or their blood pressure is very low, uh, then the doctor knows there's something very serious going on uh, inside. Um, this person is weak, this person is, is dying, right? So those vital signs say something about what's going on inside. Well, good works are kind of our uh, Christian vital signs. Um, if, if we are, are actively engaged in doing good works, that probably means that, that faith is strong. Uh, but if those vital signs are weak, are fading, um, then uh, that probably means our faith is weak uh, and dying. Number 16. Uh, it's true that we will not always do what God wants us to do. Uh, we will sometimes fail to show our thanks to God for forgiving us and giving us eternal life. Uh, what will Christians do when we don't live our life of sanctification very well or very consistently, uh, when we don't do the good works that we should to thank God? Read 1 John 1, 9 and Colossians 3, 15 through 17. So if I'm not producing many apples or if my vital signs aren't very strong or stable, uh, what should I do about that? Read those verses. See if you can come up with some ideas. So if I uh, look at my life, if I'm honest with myself and I realize that I haven't been very active, very consistent in living my life in a holy way, living my life uh, according to uh, uh, what God uh, wants me to do, uh, what's the solution? What, what should I do? Uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, um, if, if this is the case, we'll want to repent of our sins. Um, acknowledge 
very openly and honestly to God, God, I have not been living the way that you want me to live. I have been uh, failing uh, way too often um, and not doing the things you want me to do. Uh, repent of our sins and then receive forgiveness and strength by being in God's word, uh, letting God's word dwell in us richly. Um, if that apple tree is not producing many apples, uh, what it probably needs is uh, nutrients. It needs water. It needs fertilizer. It needs strength to, to produce fruit. Um, if someone's vital signs are very low, uh, maybe it's because uh, they haven't been um, eating. Maybe they haven't been eating what's, what's good for them, uh, and that's causing weakness. And so maybe uh, what, what that person needs is nutrients. Maybe they need uh, hydration. Maybe they're dehydrated, something like that. Right? So they need to be taking in what is good for them. And the same thing is true uh, for us. If we are weak in faith, and if that weakness in faith is showing itself in, in a lack of good works, then we need to receive nutrients. We need to receive God's word more and more and more. Um, if we think that that we can be good, strong, and, and healthy in the faith by uh, receiving God's word uh, once a week, or maybe, you know, sometimes people go once a, a month or once every few months or a couple of times a year um, and think that's enough. Um, well, that's, that's not enough. Um, if you only ate a meal a few times a year, um, it wouldn't take too long before you were feeling awfully weak and eventually you would die. Uh, we need to continue to feed our faith uh, regularly, uh, often, daily. Um, and uh, that's, that's where we receive strength, spiritual strength. Okay, our lesson question, what role do good works play in a Christian's life? Christians naturally and joyfully do good works to thank God for his free gift of salvation. So again, good works uh, do not contribute to our salvation. We don't do good works to get salvation. God gives salvation to us freely. And the works that we do are the natural, joyful result of receiving uh, forgiveness and salvation. All right, homework assignment for next time. Um, we looked at, memorized uh, the first half of the third article. So add the, the other half of the third article of the Apostles' Creed. So you should be learning uh, basically the entire uh, third article, review the first part, and then add what's left. So please memorize the entire third article. A couple of uh, key terms there to, to learn, good works and life of sanctification. Uh, some pages to read for more information. I always feel bad because we go through these things so quickly and there's so much good stuff to, uh, to learn and a lot of that good stuff can be found um, in, in those pages of the Catechism. So please, uh, if you have any time at all, please uh, take a look at those readings in the Catechism. And then uh, complete worksheet number 12. So that'll do it uh, for this lesson, lesson number 12. Uh, as always, please get in touch with me if you have questions or concerns. Uh, but otherwise, uh, have a wonderful day and God bless.